besides the fact that you can see your kind of grades and what I have logged for um, basically the grades, um, I also put a um, I enable the way to upload uh, an M file. So next to your homework, I uh, should be able to. I'm not sure from your view, but wait. That's not what I wanted. Um, so in when you go to great, um, let's see, how do you upload actually? I should be in Dropbox, okay? In Dropbox, you can upload. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, so you can upload the M file for the code for for the code that you know you wrote for the homework. Um, the reason for that is if something like if your code didn't publish, right, right, um, but there was just one one thing, one typo that caused all the errors, you know, to um, to appear, then I, I can figure that out, but I need the code. I cannot just look at the, at your published version, okay? So just as a matter of routine, I, I would say when you hand this in, which is still the, the way to do it, uh, just upload that, the latest version. Uh, and a warning is you cannot upload an M file as it, like uh, by itself, you need to zip it first. So it doesn't recognize .m files. Uh, you need to zip. So if you have three files for three problems, zip them in a folder and upload the folder. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. So do do it after like today, tomorrow. Just do it for homework one, homework two. Just so this way you also have a record. You know like a record of the latest uh, code, okay? Um, let's see, the grad students, I think there are only two. Uh, so if I could meet, let's see, so who else? Okay, there's a second grad student. So. Um, Rather than me talking here about the projects, maybe we can just meet and uh, and chat about that. So, um, all right. So let's see. I think we can uh, get started. Any questions on this homework? I have uh, I have the solutions here. Well, my solutions, at least a version of the solutions. So have you turned it in? Okay. So I can. I got a copy, actually. I, I got a copy one. Okay, oh, oh, thank you. Okay, so let's see. We're uh, already in Chapter 3, talking about, you know, what are the issues that come about uh, in trying to, you know, uh, design them, I mean, build a model um, and then try to solve it, but when you don't have luxury of, you know, capable, like uh, symbolic, everything done symbolically. Um, last time we talked about, I think one of the, pro one of the such situations, so, And we talked about, um, you know, again, one variable optimization. Uh, revisit it. And we talked about the nonlinear pig dot m. So the, the problem was we changed the assumptions 
from uh, linear growth or from whatever. So we, we pick some assumptions that initially were very simplistic and then we kind of tweak them a little bit and we got to a situation where solving an equation, asking the computer to solve In fact, I think it was maximizing or minimizing a function. So, but you had to, even if you had the function explicitly given, you know, by some elementary functions. So you can type it in the computer as an expression. So you can take the derivative symbolically if you want, right? But then solving this, so solving an equation of one variable became uh, becomes difficult, sometimes impossible, right? Exactly. So um, what was what was our, um, well, the method that we display was a Newton's method for approximating um, roots, right? Of equations, so of one equation. Right? So one, I have a function. Maybe it comes from a derivative of another function, but we have an equation set equal to zero, and Newton's method approximates that. So um, this was in one dimension, and the code was uh, written based on, you know, it was kind of uh, iteration. Right, so what was the code it was saying start with some x naught and then um, iterate xn plus 1 equals xn minus f of xn divided by f prime of xn. for n equals 0, 1, 2, and so forth, okay? And you have to have a stopping criterion. The simplest one was, um, you know, a fixed number of iterations, right? Or if the um, value, Oops, sorry, I should use capital F. Yes, I'm talking about that. Yep. So anyway, so there are several stopping criteria you can you can uh, code, you can put in. Um, now, how about if you have the multivariable optimization? So how about, is there a Newton's method for a multivariable optimization? Well, let me not even say optimization. For multivariable uh, problems or functions. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's imagine we don't have just um, one equation, but we have, you know, more than one. We have a system of equations. So let's start with uh, two equations and two unknowns. Okay. Make sure I'm staying with the notation. Did we use capital or small little? We use capital, okay. Okay. So let's say we have two functions, f and g. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to um, find 
approximately um, a solution. Of course, it would be uh, it would be two 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 uh, components x one x two star. So let's let's just use this notation, kind of vector notation, capital X. So by capital X, I will mean you know. Um, Depending on kind of notation, we could use uh, a row or a column, but it's it's just a pair of x one and x two. Okay. Okay. So let's um, let's kind of see where where this come can come from. So there is a problem. There is a situation described by a so-called lawn chair problem. So, example, I think it's called 3.3 .3, lawn chair. But again, it's just one of those pet, pet examples that we just use, you know, to um, develop the method and. Um, See how it gets implemented on the code. Okay, so it's still a manufacturing problem. So you have a manufacturer makes two types of lawn chairs. One has wood frames and one has aluminum frames. There's a cost for the wood frame per unit, and there's a cost for the other for aluminum frame per unit. And the market uh, markets. Conditions are so that um, the number of units sold depends on the price prescribed. So if you if you set a price, um, you you may sell a certain number of units. If that price changes, you know um, the number of units will likely change it, change as well. Okay, and the selling price has a certain um, Expression, which is kind of odd looking, right? So there are some fractional powers of those uh, numbers of units. Okay, so as you can see very quickly, it's um, we distilled kind of the situations. Uh, we went through that step one. Um, Step two and almost step three um, very quickly. So right now, all all that we matter, all that matters to us is I have um, I have this. Let me try to use x one and x two. X one. I think that's what the code uses. So okay. So I have a function of x1, x2. So x1 is the number of uh, wood frame uh, chairs. x2 is the number of wood of uh, aluminum chairs. Okay, and we're building this production. Um, excuse me, we're, we're we're building this profit function, right? That we want to maximize. So this function ends up being the number of units of one type of chairs times the price market price per unit. So, see so the price per unit is kind of has a kind of a strange model, right? So it's not. A linear dependence um, on excuse me. So let me put x one, x two here. 
Yeah. X2 has uh, this price, so 15x2 to the minus 0.4 plus 0.8 times x1 to the minus 0 0.08. Okay, so this would be kind of the revenue minus the pro minus the cost. The cost is I think $18 for the first type and $10 for the second type. Okay, so it's an ugly-looking function, and we're tasked to find the maximum or the minimum, right? Well, the maximum in this case. Uh, we don't have constraints other than saying that it uh, the two quantities have to be positive, right? So we can think about it as unconstrained. Um, you know, if we choose this approach of unconstrained, then we know what we need to do, right? We need to. So theoretically, uh, in theory, very simple, right? Simply find where the gradient vanishes, right, and solve. Now, you see, um, when you compute the gradient, you can, you can imagine what um, system you're going to get. You're going to get two equations. Right? So you're going to get partial of f with respect to x1. So let me call that to be capital F. And partial of f with respect, little f with respect to x2, and that's call it capital G. So that's what you need to do. Now let's see. Um, I'm going to flash the code here in front of you just to see how it's set up. Sorry about the size. Let me make it a little bit bigger. I think 16 is better. OK, okay so. All right, so the usual stuff, you can just start symbolically, because symbolically is um, you can type in that function. Uh, you can plot it, so you can see that indeed you know, it has a maximum. Uh, where the, the size of the domain is problematic, right, when you, when you plot it the first time. So the way I came up with that is, Again, you kind of run through the um, code first and, and kind of get an idea where the maximum might occur. Also, notice that I didn't start at 0 because th those powers are negative powers, so you would have some un uh, undefined expressions, right? Um, but it's, it's close to 0, 0 0.1 to 10. And um, what is that in units? Does it say? No, it says units per day. So I guess I guess that would be um, ten would be the num units per day. But again, this this window kind of captures the maximum. Um, all right. So 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 far, you see what uh, what we did is. Just set up the, the the gradient, right? And we can take the derivatives symbolically. So, so why not do that? But now, uh, when it comes, to, so let me run this once. Okay, and nothing. Oh yeah, you need to see the graph. So that's here's the graph. Okay, so clearly it's um, it's not clear. There might be other maxima some other other place, right? So. Um, 
unless we do some analysis of the function, we may never know, right? But there is another maximum some other place. But um, what kind of an analysis would tell us that this would be sort of the only maximum, or the absolute, absolute maximum? Right, but it will look ugly. So, if you take the derivative, you might not be able to see that that there are no other solutions. So, in fact, in fact, you could have like a like a local mountain here, right? And then you could have something that kind of keeps going up and up as you move away from, you know, with larger x one and x two. So to avoid, I mean, to kind of um, rule out such a situation where you did find a local maximum, but then the maximum can, you know, it might not be the global maximum because because the function may take higher values farther away. Uh, what do you need to do? You have to look at kind of the highest powers of the variables x1, x2, and decide whether those coefficients are positive or negative, right? What is the highest power of x1 in this expression? x to the 1, right? Because this is x to the 1 half, and this is x to some negative value, right? So this, this is kind of the, as x1 gets bigger, this one is dominating, right? And being negative says that you're going to go to 0. I mean, you're actually going to go to negative infinity. So you're going, your profit is going to, sink, right? Below the, below the zero. Same with x2, right? If that wasn't the case, you couldn't actually tell. You had to do some other things, other sort of analysis of the function to decide that you ha what you found is an, is, an, is an actual maximum value. Yeah? Just by the graph, it's, it's impossible to do. Right? Because you don't know what the window size to, to pick to, uh, to plot these things. Does it make sense? Uh, of course, you just have to try it on your own and uh, see. Of course, if you if you allow something like huge x1, uh, I mean a bigger window size, then you will see a, a you know something that you cannot tell much of it except that things are going negative very quickly, right? So again, it's it's kind of a not an art, but it's it's not uh, immediate how to to to, um, to display things. Okay, so uh, so how does this method work? Newton's method in two variables. and two or more variables. Well, so there's an algorithm, but you know, before I, we talk about the algorithm, um, I'm going to unfortunately have to change a little bit the notation. So let me imagine we have Um, n, a system of n equations with n unknowns. Okay. And let me call h to be um, the set of these functions f1, fn. Okay, and x to be x1, xn. Okay, so the system can be written as just h of x equals zero. And when we write this, we mean we have a system x is a variable, right? 
x has n components and we need we seek x star such that h at x star h at x star is zero okay so now let's remember the newton's method comes from um, writing the taylor series of the function that you're trying to set it equal to zero around this around this um, solution right so i think I think we did that, well, maybe we didn't do that that way. So let me, um, let me say the following is that um, if we think about the linear approximation, of h around or near x star. So think about one variable. At this point, imagine what you see is one variable. h is a function and x is a, a one variable. But, but what I write is also valid for, um, for systems. So what is the linear approximation? The linear approximation says h of x minus h of x or actually is approximately equal to h of x star plus this will be the derivative, right? That's, I think, what you learn in, even in Calc 1, um, is that to approximate a function around near a point, you evaluate the function at that point, then you add the derivative um, times the difference between that and the point. Visually, if it's one variable, so this is one variable, and then we see what it what it looks. So if this is h, and this is x, and this is, it doesn't necessarily have to be where h star is zero. But let's just do it like this. So if this is x star, okay, and this is an x here, the linear approximation means what? Hold on. Actually, that's not exactly how the um, we should we should make the the um, linear approximation not not around x star but around x. Okay. So let me turn that around and say, I want to make around x. So I want to. The reason why I want to uh, make around x is I know x. During my iterations, I know x, and I want to compute the next uh, value for x. So, so I'm going to do x star. I'm going to switch the, the roles of x and x star. OK, so the picture now looks what? You don't do the linear approximation at the point where you are, uh, where, that you want to find because you don't know that point, but you do the approximation around this point, right? The current, the current location. Okay. So, so now it looks um, okay, and
what you want, the desire is that so um, want h of x star to be zero so why not set up you know these are approximate values but why not set this expression equal to zero and solve for x uh, excuse me solve for x star right so zero equals h of x minus h prime of x x star minus x and then solve for x okay so what you get here is x minus h of x over h prime of x okay so this I just skipped the steps but um, so now this actually tells you that I, now I have this value for x. I'm going to use this formula to compute the new value for x. Now it's not going to be exact. Well, you have to be very lucky to get the exact solution, right? So that's 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 the idea of Newton's method in one one d. How about if it's more than one variable? Well, there is a similar. Well, there is an exact. Um, an analogous way of writing a linear approximation. Of course, you don't have the luxury of visualizing anything anymore, but um, the, the, the exact same formula stays the same. So h of x star is, if you want to call this, it's a Taylor series of the function h, which has two components. Uh, around the point x. So this is plus. Now, the problem is what is the derivative of h if it's not just a function of one variable, right? It's actually now a function of two variables and h itself has two components or more, several components, n of them, right? So what plays the role of the derivative well it's what's called a Jacobian matrix so let's see what is the Jacobian so where This is actually an n by n matrix in which you put partial derivatives of the first component of the of the function h so that's I think we call it little f1 with respect to the variables each variable that makes the first row right and you keep doing this until the last function, last component of H with respect to all variables. Okay. All right. So not only so now we 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 know what this is, and this is evaluated at x, by the way. So so all these partial derivatives are evaluated at x x being the point in that in the region where where you you're doing the um, you know search for the first solution but now i have a matrix and what about this multiplication what is this multiplication matrix. just simply matrix multiplication so that's where it's useful to think about x as being a column okay because this is now a matrix and now it's multiplied by a column and the result is a column, right? So also H is a column, right? So this now makes sense as far as matrix multiplication is concerned. Okay. And again, this is just Taylor uh, series expansion. So it comes from the Taylor Taylor. 
series expansion of H around X. Now, a Taylor, what, what, what's a Taylor? Taylor? Taylor series would actually have additional terms, right? So if you had to kind of look at the second term, what do you think you'd have to write? Hmm? Second derivatives, right? Well, okay, if it's just n equals 1, then you put second derivative, evaluate it, divide by 2, right? 2 factorial. When it gets to multivariable, that's not that easy anymore. So for instance, the second, second Second term would look like will, will look as follows: uh, h of x. So that's we've seen this dh of x, x minus x naught. And now is the second derivative at x, right? But now this thing is no longer a matrix multiplication, but it's what's called a um, bilinear form. So second, um, Right, so so it's it's no longer uh, so you have to define what this term is. It's no longer a matrix multiplication because let's see, let's um, let's remember what it is. If I write just f one, okay. So I just take one of those um, components of H. Okay, now it's a scalar. So what is this? This is f of f1 of x plus um, this is the gradient of f1 at x that's a that's a row times x minus x naught uh, what am I saying x naught I think it should be x x star here We use x not above no okay, so uh, does anybody know what's the next term when it's just a scalar? So that basically means it's partial of f1 with respect to x1 times x1 star minus x1 plus partial of f with respect to f1 with respect to xn x and x1 minus x sorry xn minus xn star so this is this term right What's the next term in the expansion? It would be second derivatives, right? And the easiest way to write this is x star x transposed the second derivative of f1 as a matrix. This is n by n now. And is x star minus x transpose, uh, excuse me, x star minus x. So this is, uh, um, if x star minus x is a, is a column, then this transpose is going to be a row, right? So it's going to be a row times a square matrix times a column. What's the output of this? It's going to be a scalar, right? 1 times n, this is n times 1.
Of course, this was 1 times n, and this was n times 1. Right? And what is this? This is the so called the Hessian, right? So it's the second derivatives. Maybe I'll just write it like this x, uh, second partial derivative of x i x j. Yeah, so that makes it n by n matrix. So you can imagine if you need additional terms in that Taylor series, it's going to get more and more complicated. Um, even if you have just a scalar function, right? But now you have, so that H is actually a stack of several such functions, right? So that's why, why that, that second term in the, in the Taylor series is going to be extra, uh, rather complicated. It's called bilinear form and so forth, okay? But the first one, all we need to know now is that really the first, uh, the linear approximation, the first term in the in the Taylor series. So I want everybody to be able to um, write the linear approximation of a function of n variables with n components. So a function of n components, each component depending on n variables, right? It's simply the derivative is a matrix multiplied by the column vector. So that's 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 the key that we want. But anyway, I just wanted to display this uh, Taylor series so you know where it's coming from. Okay, so now we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to say, well, we'd like the x star to be the solution. So we'd like to make this equal to zero. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll take these two terms, set them equal to zero, right? and solve for x star, okay? So, um, we want h of x star equals zero. Now this zero means, right, it's, a, it's an n component zero. We want this solution uh, system to be zero. I'm not gonna put errors, but that's what it, we need to keep in mind. So, so that's what we want, and now we need to solve for x star. Now, keep in mind, everything's a vector, a matrix, so we, we can no longer just, you know, uh, divide by like we did before, but it's not too different. So here's... Here's how you solve that, and then we'll see how it gets implemented. But we solve it by setting, yeah, we just move this on the other side, so it becomes minus h. And now what do we have? We have a matrix times a, times a column, and that's the unknown, with the unknown is x star, right? Equals another column. So how can we solve for x star minus x? Take the inverse. Assuming that this inverse exists, and I have a minus somewhere here, minus. Okay, and now the rest is, as they say, history, because it looks just like the uh, Newton's method in one variable, with the only difference that. Um, here we don't divide by h prime because we don't doesn't make sense to divide. I mean, there's no h prime. Instead, is the this matrix evaluated at the current x? Take the inverse, you know, multiply by uh, h of x, subtract from x. And again, this won't give us the the x star, but it will give us a new value for x. Hopefully getting closer and closer to the um, to the solution. Now, is this always 
uh, foolproof? No, I mean, there's just like in 1D, you can imagine much worse things happen in, uh, in multi dimensions. Um, that, you know, this, this uh, algorithm may never converge and so forth, but the point is that if it does converge, then um, the limit will be a solution. So, so let's see. So, so again, Newton's, Newton's method has a start with some guess, initial guess, x naught, and that already has two whatever components you need, how many n components, and then iterate x n plus 1 equals x n, and now this is a vector, right, minus this, the matrix, the Jacobian matrix, evaluated x n, inverse of it, actually, times h of x n. Okay, that's all. I mean, that's, we haven't done really any analysis that this thing converges, you know, goes to the right, um, okay? But, at least we kind of uh, described how this um, should look on a computer, and here's how it does in in this example of the launch here. Um, now, you will find ourselves sort of at um, having difficulty with the notation. Of, of course, it's one thing when you write by, on paper and another thing when you start writing in the computer. So, so far, I really should have called this H, right? Maybe we should do that. Um, but I'm afraid to change codes here on the fly. Um, so, just think about this h, but this h comes from the gradient of your objective function, right? And then, on this, on this line, what do we do? We compute the Jacobian matrix of that. So it's a two by two matrix with just derivatives, partial derivatives of each component. And again, it should be f1, f2. Okay, little f1, little f2. And then I just assemble this matrix, which should be G, uh, dh, right? So maybe we should do that. Um, I mean, do you want me to do that, or can we follow this the way it is? Just, just type. Yeah, just type then. Hmm? Well, let's see. It's it's not too difficult to. Um. Because in the end, it's just a notation, right? Okay. So. Of course, if I have to change this to little f one, little f two, then I have to do it here. This is h. F two. Oops, no, yep. Okay. And this is F1, this is F2. I mean, it's good if you can do it on your own, so. Oops. Okay, F2, okay. Um, I think this should be it, and now, now let's look in the code. In the code, what we do is we start with an initial guess, and I started with five and five. Well, even that can be tricky, right? To 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 determine where to start, um, because remember, I don't know how to plot exactly. Um, you know, the window size, so it may be I may be actually off by a lot, but anyway, so. And here again, I do a finite number of iterations, prescribed number of iterations. So let's see. The way it is is going to give me error because I have changed things around, right? So I'm 
our uh, age was the one where I have to substitute, right? So I have to substitute in, in, in age x, the current x, right? So let's give it a name, h, um, I have to give some name, h naught, right? And also I have to do this in that matrix, 2 by 2 matrix, I have to evaluate it at the current, it, uh, at the current point. Right? So the first time this goes around, it, it's evaluated at this point. So you see I substitute those two values for x1, x2 into h, and I store that as a, col as a column, right? This is going to get stored as a as a matrix, but I need to give a dh naught or something, right? And the last step is to apply that operation, right? And then the next time to uh, do the iteration with a new value, I just rename these things. But again, these things are going to be columns. Remember in MATLAB, you need a semicolon to create a, a column. Okay, so I think that's pretty much it. So let's just run it again. Hopefully there's no errors. Ah. Okay, so you see when I start changing things, it tells me there's um, somewhere capital F left Around what is it? Yep, thank you. So this should be F one, F two. It's never good to make the code in a notation that you you want. It's usually the other way around. You have to be very flexible to um, be able to change notation on the fly, whatever is more convenient. So, okay, so that's basically it has, it has found a, well, it hasn't found a exact minimum or maximum, uh, but after a few iterations, which I didn't display by the way, I, I should have displayed, so you see that actually converges, okay, but it, it ends up looking having this uh, co coordinates and then the values. Okay. How do you know it's maximum? Right, we don't even know it's a critical point, but it's close to a critical point, right? And the next thing we would have to do is we would have to do some sort of second derivative test, right? For the original uh, objective function, so we'd have to look at the metrics of the second derivatives of that original function, right? Z. So in the lawn chair, problem n was 2 and we found x1 x2 star equals 4.68 5.85 now you may say well how can you have a number of decimal number for units? Uh, depends, right? I mean, you could you could have this an average over a span of ten days, or you know, hundred days, something like that, right? So again, it depends on the modeling sort of the situation, but um, theoretically, that's where kind of we found it to be a critical point, and once again, the to decide if it's a max, to decide whether it is max or min. Um, 
we would need some sort of second derivative test. on uh, of the function, right? <coughs> Just to, what, what, what is the metrics or determinant that we have to look at? Is the second derivative of this one, right? So it's second partial of f with respect to x1 squared, right? Second partial of f with respect to x1, x2, 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 and the second partial of f with respect to x2, x1. And also we have to look at the sign of the pure second partial derivatives, right? So sign of Right? But keep in mind, what is this? This is when we take the, root, the derivative, so going back here, what would give us the first, the first term, the second derivative of f with respect to x1? That's the <coughs> derivative of, excuse me, the, yeah, the derivative of f1 with respect to x1, right? Because f1 is already the derivative with respect to x1 of... Okay? And then we have to evaluate this at that point, right? And remember that that point is not actually the exact critical point, right? So you'd have to look at the sign of this expression and see if it's, you know, far from zero, because if it's, I mean the sign, the, the value. If the value is very close to zero, it's, it would be impossible to tell, right? Whether the, the true maximum, I mean the true critical point is, um, you know, is a positive or negative, right? So you have to substitute x naught is the one, right? So substitute um, in the derivative of f1, x1, x1, x2 with x1, x0 of 1, and x0 of 2. All right, and you get it to be negative. And it's negative enough that uh, you can be, well, you can never be 100% sure, right? None of this is actually any proof, but it's an indication that uh, you have a max or a minimum. Assuming that the, the, met, uh, the determinant that you still have to compute is positive. You have a max, right? When, when the on the diagonal entries are negative, the second partial derivatives, pure ones, are negative and the determinant is positive, you have a local max. Okay? So again, I I didn't do in the code, but you'd have to do this also for the other metrics. And again, the other metrics is not, um, I think it's just dh. <coughs> h is already the gradient of little f. Okay, so you just have to be careful. So this is just dh at x star, right? And this is just um, f1. I'm sorry, it's a partial of f1 with respect to x1. Okay? Or maybe let's, let's call it capital F. Maybe it's less confusing. Okay? Okay. So anyway, so when you do the code is... Um, With Newton's method, the important thing to realize is uh, you're just solving the gradient equal to zero. So it's just, you're just solving this uh, system of equations coming from the gradient, from setting the gradient equal to zero, right? And you solve that numerically. 
Um, I think if you try it symbolically, I think I try that. Would you get anything good? So this was F1 is a mess, right? F2 is a mess. And if you have to solve F1, F2, who knows? How long it will take, but you, I, I think it's going to give you no no explicit solutions. Okay. Anyway, so that's that's just how uh, you can approximate a solution. So that's conclusion is you know um, of this problem is you know you should plan that many uh, per day. Or you should adjust the price actually based on this optimal values. Okay, so I don't know; it's probably going to take forever. Um, you should adjust. You should kind of set the prices so that you know, based on that model, you're going to get optimal pro uh, maximum profit. <coughs> this is kind of frustrating. You don't know if it's actually running or if it just froze or what. Yeah. But it's 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 very clear that you know you don't want to do try this symbolically. All right. Um, any questions on this? We haven't done any sensitivity on on any of the quantities. Yeah. Uh, it seems like after you plotted it, you could have a good idea of uh, what initial values. Um, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, no, I mean, the, the truth is that there are, you need methods of actually init, initial guessing. Um, even those can be complicated methods. So if you are, um, if you don't have a visual aid like in 2D, then you need to know something about the possible maxima possible minima so you can start close to it okay again from a modeling perspective now if you're just giving me a function of seven variables right and uh, asking you know how do I know where to start well uh, it's impossible to tell because that function might have a lot of minima local local a uh, lot of maxima and you may get trapped into a you know, you may start somewhere and get trapped in like in a local minima when the global minimum is right next to it, but you cannot escape that. So the algorithms are, you know, can, be, can get very, very complicated. Newton's method is really kind of baby method. I mean, that's kind of the first, if you've never seen any method for uh, minimizing or, or solving systems, that's what you start with, right? Uh, there are some very powerful ones, and if I have time to talk about um, some very powerful ones that are, you know, um, built in MALA. For instance, you can do F, uh, I'll just say this, and you can read about it, F min search, uh, but of course you need, you need to input something in it. And this, this is like an extremely uh, robust way of finding minima. Okay? Um, so, I just want to say, one thing about another uh, example in the book, which is about finding minima or maxima, um, it's it's a totally different problem, and I don't want to spend too much time on it. But this, the um, uh, this method is called random search method. An example is uh, 3.2, and I'm just going to show you the code for that, and I'll let you read. The, um, it's kind of an interesting practical way of of uh, deciding where to place uh, a fire station in a sort of, sort of a, in the city where uh, you have some sort of, some sort of constraints. You have to be within I don't know two minutes from every point in that city. Um, so, if you look at the objective function, which is some sort of a distance, 
or time, actually, it's probably better to think about it as average response time, okay? Um, it looks terrible, right? So you don't even want to look at it, uh, let alone to differentiate it by hand or find its minima or maxima, okay? So if you have the code, which I posted um, on, the, on our course website, um, you know, it takes a while to type it in, but if I run this, one thing that I say here is, again, don't do it symbolically because it will never, I mean, definitely will never uh, get anything out of it. But if I run this, and it takes a little bit of time. What this random search actually does, it's, I mean, the word, uh, the title says it, it started with some initial, um, so this is how the function looks like in a, in a contour plot, okay? So in a contour plot, it's clearly there's a kind of a minimum point here, so that's the, you want the minimum average response time, okay? But you want to pinpoint it. So what happens is I have some sort of a movie which is um, probably illustrates this a little bit better. What you do is you start with the initial guess, which is this point, right? And then you randomly pick. I mean, that's kind of the, uh, the craziest idea, right? You just randomly pick points in that region, right? And you do it with a certain distribution. I think here is just uniform distribution. So every point is equally likely, or every region right, of a certain size is equally likely to be hit. Um, and what happens is you only record things where the value of the function is actually lowered from the previous one. Right? So this movie kind of illustrates, um, if I could run it again, there's some flickering, I don't know why. The smallest are the ones that are picked at random, one at a time. The red dot, every time uh, I found, so it's, it's evaluating the value of the function at, at this point, and if it's lower than what it was before, it's, it puts a red dot. Otherwise, it doesn't, right? So you see that there are only like one, two, three, four. Again, I don't know why it's... Uh, um, okay, one, two, three, four, five maybe points that actually got lower, right? And again, you have some stopping criterion which says, okay, it's enough, right? I mean, you have all kinds of limitations, right? When you can only, I mean, your your uh, your region search region can only be like uh, uh, as small as I don't know one block, right? Ten meter, I mean. 100 meters by 100 meters or something. So you don't, need, you don't need accuracy, right? So that's the reason why this random search is, is working well, because it just says, well, if I'm doing a random pick of points, and I do like 1,000 points, what's the probability that I'm going to be actually hitting a region of size 100 by 100 meters, right? Um, well, it's going to be... You just have to divide the area, the total area, by the area of the small thing, and, and figure out the probability, right? So it is likely you're going to actually hit that point, that that region, right? And that's good enough. You see, I found a value here which, you know, has these coordinates and has this minimum, whatever is the average time. If I run it again, is it going to give me the exact same point? No, because the random search picks other. But is it going to be still in that in that region? Yeah. Now, is this the best method to, to use for, for minimizing? No way. But for certain kind of uh, rough modeling problems, that's, a, that's the first thing to try, for instance, right? So you see it's, it's, it's finding you know, smaller and smaller, and this code actually lists the iteration. So, um, so for instance, in this run of the code, 
there's been first iteration was picked pretty close to being a minimum, right? And then only the 87th, so all of the other ones were higher, right? Only close to the end, it kind of got lower, a little bit lower. In other runs, it might take several iterations. Okay, but that's been pretty much random search. See, so the second, the seventh, the fifteenth iteration, it got lower, right? The other ones didn't get lower. Okay, thirty-seven. So. Okay. So anyway. Um, just look at that problem and and, uh, and and see the code. I think one of the homework, by the way, I signed the homework for next week uh, on the web from chapter three. Um, you, I think you you will have one of the problems that you have to do this. Again, there's really nothing to do. Um, I would say to look at the code and see how to implement choosing random points. Next homework is due Monday, yeah, so a week from today. And uh, let's see, so Wednesday we're going to start talking about linear programming. Um, in case you have seen anything before, it's probably a good idea to refresh. We'll talk about a little bit about the theory, but we'll quickly get to the application. So um, the more familiar you are, the better. Okay? And tell your friends to show up here because... <laughs>